Hello, my dear students. This is Dr. Monica Migliorino Miller, and I am your professor for the Franciscan Values class at Madonna University, and I want to offer you this very, very warm welcome. Even though this is um, not me in person, obviously, but we will uh, soon be getting to that um, in future classes. So, um, I want to go through the syllabus with you that I have already emailed to you so you can either make a hard copy of it and go through this with me together or take a look at it on your computer screen as we're going through the syllabus. So you will see my name there towards the top and if you ever want to get a hold of me all you got to do is call me on my cell phone so I'm giving you my personal information, contact information, my cell phone, and also my personal email. So if you ever want to get a hold of me, really use that personal email there, M.M. Miller Life, um, instead of the Madonna email, only because I read my personal email ten times more often than I do the Madonna and uh, email, and so I'm going to see that a lot quicker. So that's the way you want to get a hold of me. Uh, notice the office hours are noted there on uh, the syllabus, but these hours may not be convenient for you. Um, and so if you need to get, you know, you want to get together, I'm happy, very happy to uh, make a special appointment with you so that we can get together uh, and talk about whatever's on your mind. So uh, not a problem there. Now, please note the textbooks. Um, we will be reading a biography of St. Francis of Assisi. In fact, I'm going to be giving you a short lecture today on the biography. And so uh, hopefully you actually have your textbooks already. You should have that biography by um, the author Omer Engelbert. So here it is, the biography we're going to be going through. And then we're going to be going through the uh, writings of St. Francis of Assisi, which is a pretty short book because um, unlike some other saints, perhaps like St. Thomas Aquinas, um, St. Francis of Assisi didn't write a lot. Um, we're going to also then take a look at a book called Francis of Assisi and the Future of Faith and another book um, in defense of nature and I'm going to be providing you with various articles and readings um, as we go through this semester. You'll notice on the first page of the syllabus the uh, grading scale, so do definitely take a look at that. And also please note that not everything is weighted or has the same weight. Quizzes are counted once and then your tests, the first test and the second test, are weighted twice. The final counts three times, and then any assignments that we may have, those assignments will also count just one time. So um, it's kind of important that you, you know that those grades are going to be entered in that way when we uh, calculate the grade. The uh, second page of the syllabus uh, gives you the um, course uh, lecture schedule and also coming to class is really important. Attendance is important and when you're in class, um, yeah, I definitely have some rules. Uh, you are allowed to drink beverages and um, but no eating. There's no eating allowed. I was pay, you know, potato chips or protein bars or cookies or whatever. Um, of course, like right now, you could be sitting in your bathrobe and drinking beer and eating pizza, but <laughs> we're not going to be doing that when we come into class. The other thing is turn off your cell phones. Absolutely no electronic media is permitted during the lecture times, during your time in class. Now, I do have an exception to that. If I know a lot of students want to take notes or they prefer to take notes on their computer. And that's okay. So I'm going to assume that if your laptop is open in front of you that you're using that laptop to take notes. I'm not going to monitor uh, the situation. This is all on the honor system. 
I'm not going to uh, suspect that anybody's surfing the web or, or uh, accessing their email or looking at their Facebook page or whatever. Um, you can also uh, record the lecture if you want to do that. I know some students you know, um, are audio learners and they, they, that's a really great way to capture uh, the lecture. Um, so go ahead and do that if you prefer to do that. The, it's really important to take notes uh, during class. And you should actually have a dedicated uh, notebook for this course. Um, and taking really good notes, thorough, thorough notes, is going to help you enormously uh, when it comes time to um, study for a test and, and your quizzes and so on. Okay. And then maybe the last thing I just want to mention is the integrity policy. We want to be honest, right? We don't want to cheat. Um, copying answers from another student's paper, uh, you know, a cheat sheet, uh, you know, tucked in your shoe or whatever uh, during a test, um, collaborating with a student or copying another student's work. We all want to be honest and, you know, there's just no reason for cheating. I, I'm on your side. If you're having, if you're struggling, you need extra help, you're going to get it. If you need extra credit, you're going to get it. So just be honest, do your own work, and uh, there, you know, there'll be no uh, conflicts or tension, um, you know, if I happen to, to catch, right, in any student uh, who has been plagiarizing or, or cheating, you know, cheating on their work. So that's pretty much it for the syllabus. Um, we want to turn our attention to the textbook. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi, a biography. Uh, we're going to be going through pretty much the first five chapters um, during this um, YouTube lecture. And we want to turn to page one, which is the introduction uh, to the biography. And the first thing you want to note are the dates. Now, we, you know, St. Francis of Assisi. So, he's an Italian. Uh, he um, was born, lived all of his life, except for some trips to uh, Rome um, and uh, to the Middle East, which we'll, we'll get to a lot later. Um, but he is a resident of a small town in the province of Umbria in central Italy. I have been to Assisi about maybe three or four times. It is as charming a place uh, as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and the neat thing about it in some ways, there's a lot of, there's a lot of neat things about Assisi, uh, but it's, it's still contained within its medieval walls. It has never grown outside of its, me, its medieval walls um, that go back uh, many, many centuries. The dates um, that we want to, to know are the, day, the year of his birth, uh, 1181, 1181, so that means he was born towards the end of the 12th century, and the year of his death is 1226, so he is born uh, within the first 30 years of the 13th century. So we are looking at someone who is right in the middle of the Middle Ages, and he died at the age of 45. So a middle-aged man. Some, some may say even approaching old age at the age of 45. Um, for we consider 45 nowadays is, is young. Um, but in any case, he died at the age of 45. Um, in terms of the um, introduction, um, page number two, towards the bottom of the page, talks a little bit about Saint, the writings of St. Saint, of Saint Francis. And then you are introduced to his first biographer, and that would be Thomas of Celano. And he, he wrote this first biography um, of St. Francis of Assisi uh, very soon after St. Francis died. So Thomas of Solano would be certainly then considered a contemporary of St. Francis. 
And so if we take a look at page number three in the third paragraph, Thomas of Celano was Francis's first biographer, a talented writer and careful historian who had received into who had been received into the Franciscan order by the saint himself. So he knew Saint Francis of Assisi. Thomas was chosen by Pope Gregory the Ninth to write the saint's life immediately after his death in 1226. And uh, the first biography went through a number of revisions. So there's what's called this, the, the Vita Secunda, the second life, so the second version, shall we say. There is another biographer, very important figure, um, St. Bonaventure. And St. Bonaventure's name is right there at the bottom of page number three. St. Bonaventure was a bishop, a Franciscan, and a bishop in Lyon, France. And uh, he is another very important biographer who wrote the bi his biography about, about 30 years after the death of St. Francis. And so he's noted at the bottom of page number three. Going over then to uh, chapter number one, we are introduced uh, in chapter number one, beginning on page number five, um, the author has given us a summary and you know, description of the political and social atmosphere uh, in Italy uh, during the time of St. Francis. And it's interesting to note that when it, come, when it came to social class, social class was, was very definitely marked by the nobility and those who were not members of the nobility and so you were either part of what's called the majores, the, the majors, right? Uh, and those would consist right at the very bottom of page number five. The majores were the nobles, the knights, the lords, who constituted in those times of general brigandage a permanent police force. Um, they are the ones who will be uh, responsible for protecting the serfs, and uh, the, those who are non-land owners, and those would be referred to as the minores, or those who are minor. Okay, um, there's going to be a, a major social economic shift that takes place uh, towards the beginning of the 13th century, where some of these um, members of the of the minors. Uh, are going to uh, be able to accumulate property and wealth. And so we have the development, the, the development of a new merchant class. And to, to shift from the miners to the majors, let's put it that way, you need to own property. So a new property class is on the rise. Um, and some of this is a consequence, frankly, as is noted on page number six uh, of the Crusades. The Crusades are going on during the lifetime of St. Francis of Assisi. And some of you may have taken a church history here at Madonna, if you took it with me. We actually read um, four or five chapters in a book on the Crusades, so you may have some acquaintance with what the Crusades were all about. But the Crusades uh, contributed to uh, to the rise of this new economic class because new trade routes were opened up and new goods and new services were now accept, you know, accept, accessed. There, were, there was access to uh, these exotic uh, items that were coming out of the Middle East um, through these new trade routes. And so people were able to take advantage of a new economic opportunity as a consequence of all of that. So you're given a, as I said, you're given an overview of this economic political climate during the time of St. Francis of Assisi. Now, if you go to page number eight, um, the place where St. Francis lived, this province of Umbria in the middle of Italy, was broken up into merchant guilds. 
And very unfortunately, these merchant guilds did not get along. And they con constantly were battling each other, arguing with, with each other, even in bloody, very terrible, bloody feuds uh, between these merchant classes. And so that's discussed, and you're given a description about that on page page number eight. Um, there is also, we find, a, a very nice description of Umbria, uh, the province of Umbria, between pages eight and nine in your, in your book. Um, going over to uh, page number 10 and some of the history of the city of Assisi on page number 10. It is claimed that the city was evangelized by the year A.D. 50, so 50 A.D., by St. Crispaldo, who was a disciple of St. Peter. But it is St. Rufino who is reputed by the Assisians to have really converted them two centuries later. Condemned to death and drowned in the Chieschio, it's a river, he was first uh, buried in a temple to Diana near this river. Then in 412, this is of course regarding Saint Rufino, uh, then in the year 412 his body was solemnly brought into the city. Um, going into the third paragraph on page number 10, uh, your author is giving you a tour of Assisi. And he says, we must climb the ruins of the Rocca. And actually, your professor's been there. I've been to that very top of that, the fortress at the very top of Assisi. Of course, most of it's in ruins now. Um, but you climb up this little mountain, and there's a fortress at the, at the top of the mountain. So we must climb to the ruins of the Rocca, the ancient feudal castle, to have a sweeping view of the entrancing landscape. And I have to say that the surrounding countryside outside of Assisi is absolutely splendid. This is a very, very beautiful part of Italy. We move over to page number 11, and we are actually here beginning the formal biography of St. Francis of Assisi himself. And so we see the names of his parents. His father is Peter Bernardone, or Bernardon, the father of the future saint. Um, and he was a wealthy textile merchant. So he is one of that, that, that rising up merchant class that I described just a little, uh, a little bit ago. His mother, uh, her name is Pica, P-I-C-A, and there is even some conjecture that perhaps Pica had nobility in her family, uh, came from noble stock, so to speak, and that she uh, she was a very elegant, very sophisticated, sophisticated woman, uh, cultured, educated, and had a very kindly temperament. She was very serene and, and very, in some ways, opposite <laughs> um, uh, Peter Bernardon. Uh, Peter Bernardone was a, a very lively figure, uh, very prone to anger, outbursts of temper, was very, very strict, and had big plans for his son Francis. Um, so as we read, in, read more of this biography, you're going to see all of that. Um, because of uh, Peter Bernardone's um, uh, business, um, he often traveled, and he would go on, on trips to other countries, and when um, Pika was pregnant with uh, Francis, uh, Francis's father took a trip to, to France. Now, that's where there has been some debate on how it is that Francis received his name. His actual name is John. He is baptized John, Francis is actually a kind of nickname. It's sort of like as if your parents, while well, your mother was pregnant with you, um, took a trip to Germany or uh, took a trip to Italy, and so they named you after the country where, where your mother gave birth to you. 
Um, so nobody, you know, nobody names their kids Germany or German. Uh, nobody names their kids Italy or Italia or Italio, even though I actually did know somebody named Italio. Um, but in any case, uh, so there's, there's some conjecture that because um, St. Francis's dad was on a trip to Francis when, uh, I'm sorry, was on a trip to France when Francis was born, he got this nickname, Francis. There is another theory that France, St. Francis was um, fond of speaking French. And I guess he was probably pretty good at it. Um, and and, and uh, as a consequence of that, he was nicknamed uh, the French boy or Francis. So that's discussed. We get some discussion about that on page, page number uh, 12. Moving over then to... Uh, page number 14. Now, St. Francis of Assisi was not born a saint. And you're going to see that um, for most of his life, before his great conversion experience, he was a very spoiled kid. And he was very fond of luxury. And he was very popular. And he dreamed of worldly glory, worldly success. And he was fond of going to parties. And he really, really loved to wear nice, luxurious clothes. And in this, in this rising of the merchant class, one of the ways that you would actually show off that you're you know, not one of the minors, but now you're one of the major, in the, in the majors, is the, the fine, um, you know, a des designer grade, shall we say, uh, clothes uh, that you would be wearing. So there's some um, description about the life that St. Francis led prior to his conversion. Um, so starting actually at the bottom of page number 13, if we are to believe Thomas of Silano, the upbringing of the little Bernadon boy was dreadful. In our day, and even from the cradle, he writes, Christian parents are wont to bring up their boys in softness and luxury. These innocents are barely able to lisp when they are taught shameful and abominable things. They are scarce weaned before they are forced to utter obscene words and commit indecent acts. Should they attempt to resist, the fear of ill treatment would get the upper hand over their resistance. The more perverted they become, the more pleased are their parents. And when they grow up, they rush of their own accord into more and more criminal practices. And the diatribe continues with a profusion of redundant and balanced phrases. Um, when all is said and done, St. Francis of Assisi was an ordinary Christian. Uh, if you take a look at the second paragraph on page 14. In no rush to get to heaven and putting off all active concern for his salvation. And the next paragraph. Italian or provincial, noblewoman or commoner. Dame Pica was in any case his superior. In other words, Pica was the superior to Peter in terms of her breeding, her upbringing, her sophistication, her appreciation of the finer things of life. Pica was in any case his superior. Ordinarily, she was a meek creature, submissive and retiring, but one who, on occasion, dared brave her husband's wrath. At the bottom of page 14, it was the custom then to advertise one's wealth by one's clothing. And luxury was, for the most part, confined to dress. Men vied with one another in wearing the richest and most showy textures. And then... Um, Here's the thing, you know, when we say, okay, that, you know, St. Francis um, was living a life of the spoiled boy, um, given to luxury, wanting to have a good time, but Francis was also a person of 
um, in a sense, a sensitive moral character. He was very, very generous, and he always had a heart for those who were uh, less fortunate. And so if you see there on, on page number 15, um, at any rate, this is in, in paragraph number three, page number 15, at any rate, never did anyone see a more affable and charming merchant. In addition, he was, says Thomas of Solano, most prudent in business, but it soon became evident that if Francis excelled in making money, he was still better at spending it. Naturally liberal, he gave abundant alms. Love for the poor was born in him, writes St. Bonaventure, and he had made a special resolution never to refuse anyone who solicited alms in God's name. So, if you were a beggar and you approached St. Francis and you said, for the love of God, help me, uh, you know, do you have anything to give to me? Francis would give it to them. At the bottom of page number 15, by his way of looking at things, observes one of his biographers, he was the exact opposite of his father. Much more whimsical and less thrifty, he lived above his station, rushing pell-mell into pleasure and throwing away everything he earned on feasts and sumptuous clothing. So you know that uh, his father was very thrifty, you know, wanting to save money, wanting to conserve his possessions, um, and well, and frankly, make a lot of money. Um, so uh, there's a difference, certainly a difference there. Uh, there's a description on page number 16 of the, um, the pleasures that uh, St. Francis liked to uh, indulge in. So right at the almost at the top of the page, page number 16. At that time, there were youth groups in Assisi in which boys from middle-class homes mingled with a few nobles and had good times together. And the year round, there were well-wined banquets, noisy gatherings, farandals danced through the streets of the little city and nocturnal serenades beneath the balconies of local beauties. There was feasting and laughter, poetry and music, eccentricities and follies, and also, alas, real disorders. For debauchery was rife in Assisi, and the excesses of these night prowlers often compelled the authorities of the commune to intervene. In other words, they would be, they would be raucous. Uh, lots of times, you know, you're drinking too much and you're making a lot of noise. There might be fist fights. Um, and so the, uh, often the, uh, well, their version of the police uh, would have to come and, uh, and inter intervene. Um, going over then to page, uh, page number 19. top of the page. But sinner or not, it would be an error to think of the youthful Francis as a rake. One cannot imagine him as either corrupt or corrupting. In other words, Francis had a very good nature. Um, I think, you know, from the descriptions of Francis, he was naturally joyful, generous, sensitive, one cannot imagine him as either corrupt or corrupting, and if there were some weaknesses in his life, assuredly baseness was not among them. For example, he would not be given to crude jokes. He would not be making fun of, you know, uh, of fun of women. He would not be making derogatory remarks about people that he didn't like. He would not be using obscene, foul language. So we got to, you know, get, get a picture of what, who it is that we're talking about here. But if Francis loved, it was nobly, and in the manner of the knights of chivalry, whose ideals he shared, he was a prey to temptations of the flesh, since we shall see him later on rolling in the brambles and in the snow to get rid of them. But his deportment and his speech were almost always perfectly proper. Francis dreamed of worldly success. He wanted to be 
famous. He wanted to make a name for himself. And one of the ways that you would do this during the time of St. Francis is that you would join the military. You would gain fame and people would flock to you and sing your praises because you were successful in military exploits. And so if you take a look towards the bottom of page number 19, at that time fame was to be acquired in war and those who liked fighting found opportunities galore. So moving over to um, page number 21. Francis joined the local military in his province of Umbria. The province of Umbria was almost perpetually at war with the neighboring province of Perugia. And so indeed, uh, uh, during uh, Francis's life, after he joins the military, uh, he goes to war uh, with the Umbrian army against the province of Perugia. And so if you take a look at, at uh, page number 21, uh, delivered from its oppressors, was Assisi at last to enjoy its newly won liberty in peace? Not so. For Perugia, the eternal rival, aroused by the nobles of Assisi who took refuge in it and who burned to recover their lost status, now entered upon the scene. In 1201, Perugia declared war on her neighbor, and a fierce duel between the two communes ensued, which lasted for at least a decade. It was during this murderous period that in November of 1202, the Battle of Ponte San Giovanni, and that, that means the Bridge of St. John, Ponte San Giovanni, was waged by the Tiber below Perugia. Francis fought in it bravely, was taken prisoner, and carried away as a hostage to Perugia. And he remained in captivity for uh, just about a solid year. He is eventually, and well, by the way, one of the reasons he's, you know, not executed or tortured or anything like that uh, is because the Perugians uh, knew that his father was a fairly wealthy man, and so they were holding uh, Francis uh, to negotiate a ransom. Uh, eventually, the ransom is going to be paid, and uh, Francis of Assisi will be uh, released from captivity, and he will go back to Assisi. And that pretty much brings us to the end of chapter number one. Let's go on then to chapter number two. There is a, a nice physical description of St. Francis of Assisi on page number 22. And um, if you are really motivated, you could uh, go to the internet and um, do a search, you know, a Google search for the famous portrait of St. Francis of Assisi by the famous artist Giotto. And um, when this is a portrait when St. Francis was already, had already founded the Franciscan order, um, a very, very famous painting. When Francis goes back to Assisi uh, after his release from captivity, he thinks that he's just going to go back to the way things were before, and he is again going to want to get involved with the military and uh, go back to uh, his party life and so on. And so we take a look at page number 23. Um, on the contrary, he resumed his life of business and pleasure, but then he fell gravely ill. And this this illness lasts for many weeks. Had his long imprisonment weakened him? So in other words, maybe he contracted a disease while he was, you know, holed up in the prison there in Perugia. Or once liberated, anxious to make up for lost time, had he overtaxed his strength? At any rate, he now spent long weeks in bed, during which time his thoughts began to take a different tack. And so 
the things of the world that had attracted him, the things of the world, and, and I, I don't mean just uh, material things, but uh, taking walks in the woods, um, taking pleasure in God's creation. Even those things um, for St. Francis um, didn't have the same joy, did not give him the same pleasure. And so he, he's wondering why, you know, what, what's, what's, what's changed? Something's changed. So in any case, this is all already, the, in some ways, the first step towards what will be a very profound religious conversion. Um, again, though, as we, as we see towards the bottom of page number 23 and into page number 24, he dreams of that worldly glory, obtaining that worldly glory and, uh, and worldly fame by becoming a knight. And so that's, that's described at the bottom of page 23 and into page number 24. There's a description, however, of the kind of charity that Francis practiced um, even before he had that very profound religious conversion. And one of the things, if you're going to be a knight, because being a knight was very, very expensive. You had to outfit yourself. You had to have a grand horse. The horse had to be outfitted. You needed um, uh, equipment, armor, weapons. And, and so this was not cheap. And a lot, of, a lot of young men who also aspired right, to fame and fortune uh, by becoming a knight um, would also try to get these items for themselves. And, uh, and sometimes they were just not very good at it. Um, so taking a look at page number 25, uh, towards the middle of the page, one may well imagine that Francis had no intention of being outdone by anyone, uh, who, who, and Francis was known to be, you know, do things in the grand manner, nothing, nothing halfway. Meanwhile, he met a knight, so ill-clad that he was almost naked, did the, the, did the seedy warrior implore his charity? Or was Francis spontaneously touched by his dilapidated appearance? Be that as it may, the fact is that he gave to him generously for the love of Christ the sumptuously embroidered garments he was wearing. He had acted like St. Martin, Thomas of Silano writes, and like St. Martin, this would be St. Martin of Tours, Francis received his reward from God in a symbolic vision that he had the following night. And then we have a description of the dream. He saw in a dream his father's house changed into a marvelous palace with arms. The bales of cloth had disappeared and were replaced by magnificent saddles, shields, lances, and all kinds of knightly harness. Moreover, in one room of the palace, a beautiful and charming bride was, uh, was waiting for her bridegroom. Francis, thunderstruck, was wondering all, what all this could mean when a voice revealed to him that the soldiers and this beautiful lady were reserved for him. He awoke with happiness since this vision, as he thought, could only be symbolic of the success he was to achieve. <laughs> Well, the fact is St. Francis is going to have other dreams that are going to uh, supersede uh, that one, uh, that you are not going to be a knight for this world, but yet that you are going to be a soldier for Jesus and you're going to be fighting for him. Um, and in fact, we have a description of, of that uh, dream on page number 26. Um, the idea in you know the the the, the uh, dream uh, focuses on who should you serve? Should you serve the servant or should you serve the master? So, for example, if you're a knight, you're going to be serving the prince or you're going to be serving the king. But the dream says, so who, what's what is better to serve the servant or to serve the king? Well, in this case, I mean, in, what's the meaning? Jesus is the real king, and any worldly king or any worldly prince is merely a servant. So if you really want to serve 
uh, the king serve Jesus and not just uh, the, the local, you know, nobleman. Page number 27 is very, very important. And on page number 27, we have a description of the last party. So, you know, Fra Francis is back from being, you know, a prisoner of war. He thinks he's going to go back and, and simply return to um, his life of uh, gaiety and pleasure uh, that he had before he went to war. And so, and, and his friends, you gotta, you, you, you gotta understand this. His friends take advantage of Francis because Francis has money. And so Francis is the one who's gonna pay the restaurant bill. He's the one who's gonna pay for the wine and the beer and the pizza that we're all going to eat. And so they like to hang out with Francis because he's the one who's gonna pay for everything. And so he pays for the party. And so we have a, a description of that on page number 27, where it says his friends had come to pro pro propose him as king of youth and had given him the scepter of his new dignity, which, if truth be told, merely signified their desire to fill their bellies at the expense of the so-called king. Too polite to refuse, Francis offered them once more one of those banquets which permitted them to surfeit themselves with food. Then these gluttons spilled out over the sleeping city, singing their drunken refrains. Francis became, came up behind them, his fool's scepter in his hand. But far from joining in with their songs which disgusted him, he began to pray. Then it was that divine grace came upon him, enlightening him as to the nothingness of earth's vanities and revealing to him the invisible realities. Suddenly he was inundated with such a torrent of love, submerged in such sweetness, that he stood there motionless, neither seeing nor hearing anything. They might have cut him to pieces, he said later, and he would not have moved. Francis experiences the futility of this life, investing in the glory of this life, and he swept into the love of God. What really matters is serving not this world, but the King of Heaven. And so this is going to... Uh, produce in him a remarkable change. He's not simply going to be able to go back to the way things were before. Um, so he's going to become what's referred to on page number 28, a miles Christi. That's Latin for soldier of Jesus, a miles Christi. And so we see that towards the, uh, well, it's actually the second to the last paragraph on page number 28. The word took on a nobler meaning in the Middle Ages. It no longer designated the soldier who goes on foot, but the mounted warrior, the Lord of the Night. Millais Christi, as pictured by the historians of the Crusades, is the brother in arms, the, the companion, the vassal of Christ. And so it is that Francis is to look on his service of the Suzerian chosen by him in the night of Spoleto. He is to proclaim himself the herald of the great king and the standard bearer of Christ. And he will call his followers, his companions of the round table. So right here we're already seeing that Francis is thinking of founding a community of the Miles Christi, the soldiers for Jesus like the Knights of the Round Table, but these would be the Knights of the Round Table for Jesus. And so this is the really the beginnings of his, of his creation of the Franciscan order in its um, most incipient stages, right? Um, what does he want to become? He wants to be a martyr. He wants to die for Jesus, as a good soldier would want to die for his king. St. Francis wants to die for his king, for Jesus. And that's, that's described for us on page 
number 29. What is going to most attract Francis and really what marks Francis and what will then mark Franciscan values, Franciscan spirituality, is this love of poverty. St. Francis wants to imitate, radically imitate, literally imitate, the poverty of the King of Kings. That Jesus came into this world as a naked baby, born in the most, you know, you know, you know poverty-stricken, in a sense, right, conditions, <laughs> not in a hospital, not in a, uh, a hotel, or in the comfort of his own home, but Jesus born in a stall. Um, he, had, uh, the, he had to borrow his, 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 Joseph and Mary, right? Had to borrow the place where Jesus was going to be born. And so his bride, the, 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 the bride of St. Francis will be what he refers to as Lady Poverty. And we see uh, your author in your textbook uh, going into that in a lot of detail on page number 30. Um, he's, he is going to marry a princess, and the princess is called Lady Poverty. And so what does that really mean, though? And so we take a look at the second paragraph on page number 30. Loving poverty does not mean limiting yourself to loving the poor while taking care that you yourself lack nothing. It means becoming poor with them. It means refusing to enjoy yourself while they, the poor, are suffering. And it means to embrace, as our Lord did, their state and their neediness. Such is the form of heroism that the sanctity of St. Francis was to take. People remarked that his love for the outcasts had increased. He gave them, we are told, more and more alms. If he had no money, he would give his cap, his belt, some portion of his clothing, sometimes even his shirt. He also sought sacred vessels for needy priests so that they could celebrate Mass in a, in, in, in a, um, in, in a way that was befitting right, uh, the sacrifice of the Mass. And when his father was absent, he would place much more food than was necessary on the family table, thinking of the beggars who would come after the meal for the leavings. This little stratagem, of course, did not escape his mother, but she said nothing against it, for she loved and admired Francis more than her other children. In short, Francis reached the point where he was concerned solely with the poor and was happy only in their company. The truth was, writes Thomas of Celano, that he had become one of them, thinking only of sharing their life of privations. He loved poverty itself. Going on to page number 31, he is going to go on a pilgrimage to Rome. And he's actually rather scandalized by the way the pilgrims are stingy with their alms when they, when they give to uh, the, the um, charity uh, baskets right there at St. Peter's Basilica. So, so there's some uh, discussion about that on the towards the top of page 31. Arriving at St. Peter's tomb, he was scandalized to see the pilgrims so niggardly with their money and making such mean offerings. Really, he thought, this is no way to honor the Prince of the Apostles. And taking his purse filled with gold, he flung it toward the altar. And he didn't care who was going to pick up the pieces. I mean, this St. Francis can be, can be very spontaneous. Um, sometimes he doesn't completely think through what are the consequences. You know, it's sort of like, well, I'll give money to this beggar, but, you know, maybe he's going to go off and buy a six-pack of beer with it, right? Or drugs. Um, you know, he's, he's not prudent uh, so much in that sense. Um, the second paragraph on page number 31 when Francis had finished his devotions, he went out encountering in front of St. Peter's the beggars with whom this place teems at all times. 
And by the way, if you go to Italy, you go to Rome, there are a lot of beggars, even today. You Honestly, it's almost you can't walk 50 feet without encountering a beggar. And so I, I, I also try to be um, generous. I even say I have my, my budget, my, my beggar budget uh, that, I, that I, I use uh, if I go traveling in Italy. Um, there it was that he proposed to one of them, one of these beggars, that they, ex that they change clothes. An offer which, as one may well imagine, was not turned down. Putting on the wretched fellow's rags and mingling with the troop of beggars, he begged along with them, shared their sordid meal, and found so much happiness in his taste of this kind of life that he would have asked nothing better than to, than to keep on with it. That, that is a very beautiful insight, exchanging his clothes with the, the beggars outside of St. Peter's Basilica. We turn to page number 32. And this is enormously important. One thing that Francis found enormously difficult, as you can well imagine, was to be in the presence of lepers. And there would be those in Assisi, uh, well, not in the city, because they were actually not allowed to come into the town, right? But in the outskirts of the, of the town of Assisi, um, there were those who were afflicted with the, with the terrible disease of leprosy. And this, is, this encounter with, with the lepers is another way in which we see this profound change in St. Francis. Um, he says, During my life of sin, nothing disgusted me like seeing victims of leprosy. It was the Lord himself who urged me to go to them. I did so, and ever since, everything was so changed for me that what had seemed at first painful and impossible to overcome became easy and pleasant. Shortly after, I definitely forsook the world. And so there's a, a description of an encounter that Francis has with one of these lepers in um, the fourth paragraph on page 32. But one day, at Abandon the Road, he suddenly found himself facing a man afflicted with leprosy. His first reaction was to turn back. But he immediately changed his mind and dismounting, because he was riding a horse, he embraced the wretch, gently putting some coins in his hand. He thereupon felt a great happiness pervade his whole being. It was God keeping his promise and changing bitterness to sweetness for him who had preferred bitterness to sweetness. But the young man was not content with his first victory. He sprang to the saddle and rode to a neighboring lazarette, apparently, St. Lazario de Acre, about two miles from Assisi. Francis entered this last refuge of human misery. In other words, this is a commune of lepers. And he's going to go there and spend time with them. He assembled its unfortunate inmates and begged their pardon for having so often despised them. He lingered some time in their company, and while waiting to come and live near them, he distributed money to them, and left only after kissing them all on the mouth. I think we'll end our first lecture here. Uh, the most important thing for you to do, besides listening to this lecture, read your book. You should read at least through chapter 5, chapter, chapter 1 through chapter 5. I, I ask God to be with you. And I hope to see you all very, very soon. Bye now.